Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be talking about topic 3.5, which is population growth and resource availability. So if you haven't already seen video 3.4, where we talked about carrying capacity, make sure to check out that suggested video link at the top of the screen right now. Since we'll be building on carrying capacity and limiting factors today, it's really important that you've seen that first. So like I said, we've been talking about carrying capacity and how limiting factors like food availability or predation will determine the carrying capacity. But today we'll be going into a little greater depth uh, when it refers to characteristics of populations and how population growth is determined by a variety of factors. So here on the screen, we have an example of a species whose growth is often limited by their own competition. So when deer become too dense in an area, they can exceed the carrying capacity based on the amount of food availability, and they're going to experience a die off. And we'll talk today in the video about other factors that influence population as well. So let's take a look at our objectives, essential knowledge, and our science practice for the day. Our objective today is to be able to explain how resource availab availability affects population growth. And we have a couple different essential knowledge points, but they're very simple ones today. The first two just tell us that resources are always limited in an ecosystem and that these limited resources like food and space will then limit population growth. The third essential knowledge point for today is the idea that population growth and carrying capacity can increase if those limiting resources increase. And we'll look at an example with paramecium and their food resources increasing. And the fourth essential knowledge point today is the opposite of the third. When limiting resources are decreased, there will be a decrease in individuals' ability to survive and reproduce, so the population will drop back down below carrying capacity. And our suggested skill to practice today will be a math skill, and that's applying mathematical relationships to solving a problem. So we'll practice doing that at the end of the video. So first we'll talk about some basic population characteristics that are important to understand before we go into the factors that will limit population growth. So first we have population size. This is really straightforward. It's just the number of organisms in a population, and we'll sometimes denote it or represent it with the letter N. It's important to know that the larger a population is, generally the safer it is from population decline due to factors like genetic diversity that can allow organisms to adapt to new environmental conditions. And certain species even get protection from predators by having a large herd. And that can be another example of large population size being beneficial. Density is the number of individuals per unit of area. So we have an example here. We could have 12 panthers per square mile or per square kilometer. And generally, the more dense a population becomes, the stiffer the competition for resources and the more likely that a disease outbreak is since diseases move more easily between individuals in a more dense population. And then finally, we have distribution. And this is just how organisms are spread out in a population compared to one another. So random distribution is typical for plants like trees who have their seeds dispersed randomly by the wind or by animals. Um, although it's important to know that some plants will put out defensive chemicals into the soil, which kills other plants in the area. And that would lead to them having what we would refer to as a more uniform distribution. So uniform distribution is typical of these plants that secrete defensive toxins or of nesting animals or predatory animals that defend a central den or nest area plus the area around it. Shorebirds are another great example of this. And lastly, we have clumped distribution. And this is gonna be typical of animals that live in herds or groups like these meerkats here. Sex ratio is the last population characteristic we'll talk about today. It's a very important one though. Uh, it's just the ratio of males to females in a population. But it's important to know that generally the closer to 50-50, the more optimal for reproduction. And events that lead to large die-offs or bottleneck events like natural disasters can leave already small populations with really skewed sex ratios. So for instance, if we have a 75-25 ratio of males to females, that population may have a really tough time recovering from that decline because there are so few females, which limits population growth. Next, we'll talk about factors that limit population based on density and factors that limit population independent of density or not based on density. So density dependent factors are gonna limit population growth due to individuals becoming too densely populated. Another way to think of this is as increased competition for food, water, or habitat sets in, 
we're going to see factors that limit population size. Even disease can be a density dependent factor because it spreads so much more easily in dense populations. Another way to think about density dependent factors is if you have a population of 50 deer and a population of 5,000 deer. A drought that limits tree growth is going to impact that 5,000 deer population a lot more significantly than the 500 deer population. And so we'd say that the impact on population is dependent on density here. So pretty much any resource that's limited from a competition standpoint, so food, water, habitat, nesting site, these are all going to be density dependent because they depend on how dense the population is. Uh, then there are factors that impact population growth independent or not based on density. These are factors like natural disasters, so floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, and it really doesn't matter if a deer population has 50 or has 5,000 members. Natural disasters impact both populations pretty similarly. So now we have an experiment that will give an example of a density dependent factor. And food is probably the best example of a density dependent factor because it's going to limit population growth really directly and really significantly. So here we have a really simple yet famous experiment conducted by a Russian biologist named Gregory Gauss. He grew two species of paramecium, which are single-celled organisms in a petri dish with limited access to food. So we can see in the first graph here that over the first six days or so, both species grew very rapidly. So remember, single-celled organisms like paramecium are going to have a really high biotic potential or a high maximum growth rate under ideal conditions. However, we can see that after day six or so, both species are going to arrive at a carrying capacity. So their growth is going to slow, and then eventually they'll reach zero growth or a stable population size. Then in the second graph, Gauss doubled their food supply and repeated the same experiment. So we see the same trend here. There's going to be rapid exponential growth for those first six days or so. And then eventually both species will reach a carrying capacity that limits their growth. This time, though, since their food supply was doubled, their carrying capacity was roughly doubled. And that illustrates a really important point, which is that increasing a limiting resource, food in this case, will increase carrying capacity. And it might seem pretty straightforward, but it's a really good example of how limiting resources determine carrying capacity. Now we'll look a little more closely at the model of growth that Gauss's experiment demonstrated. So like I mentioned, over those first six days of the experiment, both species grew at what we would call their biotic potential or their maximum growth rate. We also call this an exponential growth. It's very, very rapid because there's no limiting resources, food, space, habitat, None of these things have limited the growth rate of the population yet. However, if we look over at the second graph, what we'll see is that eventually competition, either within your species or with members of another species for limiting resources like food, water, or space will slow the growth dramatically until you reach a carrying capacity. We call this model logistic growth. And this is what happens in all natural ecosystems because as we know, all natural ecosystems have limited resources to some degree. So we're never going to see biotic potential or exponential growth forever. We must hit some limiting resources at some point, and that will establish the carrying capacity. And the last thing we'll do today is practice calculating population size. So this formula here can be used to calculate how factors like birth and death and immigration, new members entering a population, and emigration, members leaving a population, change the population size. So in this case, immigration and birth are the two inputs that increase population size, while deaths and emigration are going to reduce population size. An easy formula is to add up the deaths and emigration, and then subtract that number from the births and immigration. So see if you can work out the new population size of this elk population here that starts with 52 elk, then has 19 births, six deaths, and five new elk immigrate into the population in a season. So you can work this out on your own, and then the answer will be on the screen shortly. So our suggested science skill for the day is applying a mathematical relationship to solve a problem. So I want you to see if you can calculate the population size of a 14 wolf pack that experiences five deaths, three births, and has four new wolves released into the pack from a nearby wildlife sanctuary.
All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful. Subscribe for future Apes video updates and check out other notes over here to the side. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar.